Hewer, you're going to go back to throw the ball. Sets up, looks, throws toward the corner of the end zone. And he's intercepted! Intercepted! And that's the ball! Down to the 35, the 40! Can he wait to get a score? All right, y'all, so for those of you who do not know, I am an Oregon Ducks fan. This is my favorite college football team. Well, why? Well, as a kid, I grew up in a small town in the state called Springfield, which was pretty much a few minutes away from Eugene, which is, of course, the home of the university. And, uh, of course, that meant it was all over, all over town, all over TV. And, you know, um, there was no pro football team out there, so it was pretty much Ducks, Blazers, uh, of course, you had your Oregon State fans just by default, and uh, you know, a, you know, maybe some Seattle fans mixed in there. But always pro ducks, always green and yellow. You always saw the duck around the logo. I remember always being, you know, fascinated by a kid, uh, by it as a kid, and always, you know, saying this is Donald Duck. You know, they just took Donald Duck, but you know, that's how I always remembered it, and. Um, I, you know, even as a, I was a younger child, particularly in that 94 season, which some of my first memories, you know, kind of, uh, you know, originate. And like I said, you know, the, the logo would always stand out to me, you know, the colors. And of course, I vaguely remember the play itself with uh, Kenny Wheaton um, and just remembering, you know, being, you know, watching that game and just uh, seeing, you know, people react to that and being happy and all the, the happiness around it. Because a lot of people were watching that game that day, I remember, and, you know, just having really a lot of fun with it. And I didn't know what all college football was all about or football for that matter, but it it stuck with me and it got me interested in the sport. And that's what, you know, eventually led to me getting into the NFL, um, particularly when I moved away from Oregon. I couldn't and I couldn't watch the Ducks as much as I would like to because, of course, you know, different regions. And, um, you know, I got into I got into the NFL because of the Raiders. Over time, of course, I was able to almost keep that touch when I was going through the house. Of course, my grandpa was going along with me and asked questions when I would go out there and visit and, you know, try to figure things out. And, you know, but it just always stayed with me. And as years progressed, uh, my interest in football uh, and college, fo you know, pro and college would kind of um, change. And I would get into just from watching it and just trying to figure out who the players were and who the coach was to, you know, figuring out, you know, as of today, you know, I, you know, I can, you know, go in and research, you know, things like recruiting and, you know, things of that were going into the news and, you know, understanding, you know, when is spring, you know, spring football and things like that so many ins and outs that I can do now and you know and what I you know want to be knowledgeable of and what I'd like to present on this channel and so much of that has been inspired by you know Oregon football and of course you know Pac-12 football as a whole because uh, I was a really big fan of Reggie Bush uh, specifically and uh, just West Coast football because of course um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area after I moved away from Oregon and uh, of course we had Raiders and, and 49ers football so uh, today I wanted to go into the history of my favorite team. I'm kind of just going to touch over some points, and I wanted to also talk about my relation to the to this team a little bit more, and just kind of those moments that I had. And so, uh, like I said, it's going to be a brief history. Uh, we're going to go through, you know, the beginning, uh, you know, all about the eras, the good and the bad. Uh, we're going to talk about all that, uh, the Pac-12 rivalries uh, with Oregon State, and of course Washington a little bit as well. And, um, you know, we're going to have a good time. And hopefully what I'd like to do is, of course, get into some more college football. But I also would like to get into some more, you know, Pac-12 football specifically as well. And this is not a shot against the national media. It's just kind of an observation. And even with YouTube media as well, just it just seems to be, a, you know, it just seems that everybody likes to put the Pac-12 on some type of low totem pole. And honestly, I don't believe in conference supremacy in that type of way. I, I just see it as teams and you know in my opinion Alabama Georgia 
uh, are some of the best teams out there, um, you know, and, you know, that's kind of how I look at it. I don't think every team in every conference is great enough to say, you know, one is particularly better than the other. But, you know, that's my personal opinion. But anyways, I wanted this to be a pro Pac-12 channel. I don't feel like you see a lot of that. And I wanted to give this platform a little bit something different. So hopefully if you guys uh, like this, please share it. Uh, please make sure to, you know, subscribe if you haven't yet. And uh, without further ado, let's get into my favorite team. And of course, the Ducks would play their first season in 1894. And back then, uh, they had a weird, well, I will say a unique name. <laughs> it would be the Webfoots back then. They weren't even known as the Ducks, I feel, until I believe the 1980 season. I could be a little bit off by that. But again, their original name was the Webfoots. I guess it was something related to a duck, but hey, it is what it is. Um, but again, their first game would be a win, 40-43 versus Albany College. But they would only that would be their only win of that first year. Now, in that second year, they would go undefeated as well, but uh, they faced a lot of, um, you know, what's the word here, instability. Uh, in their first 19 seasons, they would have 16 different head coaches. Now, things wouldn't really get right until 1916 uh, when Hugo Besdick, who had been uh, who had been with the team since 1913, would actually lead the team to their first ever Rose Bowl. Uh, they also had a record that consisted of uh, seven wins and one tie. Uh, they would blow out Willamette University 97-0. They would tie to their, of course, their rival, Washington, or our rival, Washington. And um, Washington was given the, the Pacific Coast title that year, but Oregon would go on to represent the title in the, bowl, in the Rose Bowl where they would beat Penn, I think it was 14 to yet zero. We have 14 to zero. And again, I said Penn, not Penn State. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Penn State might not have had a football program at this time. Um, I'm not too sure exactly about their history, but we're definitely talking about the University of Pennsylvania. Yes, it's a different, it's a different time. A lot of different teams were were good and nationally relevant, but uh, back then it just happened to be, of course, you know, Penn. Uh, the Ducks were going to go to another Rose Bowl in 1920, but they will lose that one to Harvard. Like I said, these are different times. You'd be surprised who was winning championships back then. And one little note here, um, I wanted to kind of break down the Pacific Coast Conference real quick because this would be the basically the parent to what you see today as the Pac-12. Now, the original members were Cal, of course, uh, UC Berkeley, Washington, Oregon, and Oregon State. Now, they would go on to add Washington State, Stanford, Idaho, USC, UCLA, and also Montana. Of course, you know, Idaho and Montana, they're no longer, I think Montana is still, uh, well, actually, Montana's D2 now. Idaho, I believe, is, of course, in a different conference if they're still D1. I think they're still D1. But, of course, you know, as of today, we have Arizona, Arizona State, of course, Colorado. We've added a few different teams here. But like I said, um, just wanted to add that little bit in there because, of course, this is essential to the Ducks' story and their history is the Pac, you know, the Pacific Coast Conference, the Pac-8, the Pac-10. Of course, now we have the Pac-12. But uh, anyways, like I said, they would reach another Rose Bowl in, in uh, 1920. Like I said, they would lose to Harvard. Uh, and they would not make another ball game until 1948's Cotton Bowl. So, but with that being said, though, it wasn't like it was all bad. They actually finished with a 9-1 record twice. Uh, once in 1932, where they would share, uh, share a portion of the pack, uh, the Pacific Coast title, excuse me. And that team was led by fullback Mike Mikulak, uh, who will eventually be uh, drafted in the NFL by the Chicago Cardinals. He was an All-American. American that season as well as an all-conference player uh, they also had a great defense that only allowed 50 total points and had five shutouts on top of that and like I said they would go nine and one uh, again in 1948 and that's when they would reach the cotton ball now this season was very interesting as well they would end up uh, sharing the Pacific Coast title again uh, this time with Cal and uh, you know how this tiebreaker or you know how it was determined um, to find a representative for the Rose Bowl was that they would take a vote and all the teams of course representing you know each school uh, would take a vote and that's how they would do it and uh, Oregon was under the assumption that of course they have a you know their Northwestern schools that Washington and the rest of them would actually vote them in but uh, unfortunately for us uh, Washington decides to not only vote for Cal but to get convince Montana to do the same of course that will leave us out of the Rose Bowl and of course we have been playing Washington annually since the early 1900s but this would create the beef that you see today we don't like them 
And eventually, well, you know, they don't like us either. And that's how it's been since then. And uh, for those of you who did not know, that's how that started off. As far as Oregon State, I I just never liked them. I was just raised to not like them. I was always just told that they suck no matter how bad that we were. Um, yeah, that's all I can say about that one. But uh, that 1948 team was actually really good. Uh, it was led by a quarterback you may know if you know your, your NFL history, Norm Van Brocklin. Uh, he was a World War II veteran. He was also was an All-American in this season and finished sixth in the Heisman voting. Uh, he would go on to become a two-time NFL champion. He was a passing yards leader and an All-Pro. He also was a head coach for the Atlanta Falcons before being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, we also had running back John McKay, who will go on to be uh, not only a, an assistant coach for the program, but also a Hall of Fame college coach. So a lot of history steeped in this team. Like I said, it would go on to the Rose Bowl, uh, sorry, to the Cotton Bowl, because again, uh, they weren't voted into the Rose Bowl, but the Pacific Coast Conference allowed for them to play in another Rose Bowl as a consolation. They would end up coming up short to Southern Methodist University, 21 to 3. Now, Lynn Casanova would be probably one of your next best coaches in the early history uh we talked about their first ever rose ball win that was led by hugo bezdick one of their great uh coaches at least in the beginning uh when we start getting you know more so into the tw deeper into the 20th century their next great coach would be lynn casanova uh he would join the team in 1951 by way of pittsburgh and he would actually lead them to a, re a winning record in 1954 and he would also win the first nationally televised college football game and that was uh, that was on the road in Nebraska, 20 to 12. Now they would go on to share the pack, uh, the Pacific Coast title again. Uh, this time with Oregon State, uh, but they would be voted into the Rose Bowl, where they would lose, unfortunately, to Ohio State. Now, where have we seen this before? Yeah, well, it starts early as 1957. Now, uh, Casanova was relatively successful with the Ducks. He would have 82 total wins, which we, which would be the highest uh, win number of wins at that time. He would also lead us to three total ball games, getting a win in the 1963 uh, Sun Ball over SMU, and uh, he would go on to, you know, retire and be the, become the school's AD in 1967. And Jerry Fry would end up taking over, and it, things just, I mean, if you know. Yeah, things just started to kind of fall apart at that point. Uh, we would move into our new home, Austin Stadium, in that 67 season. But under Fry, uh, we failed to win more than six games a season. So that, that means we're not winning the Pac-12 until the Pacific Coast title. At this, it's still the Pacific Coast title um, at this point in time. Um, we're still, you know, not making ball games. So, again... It's, it's getting bad, and it would get worse uh, throughout the 70s, and eventually we would uh, add, uh, what well, we would hire Rich Brooks in 1977, and he would end up becoming one of our best coaches, but again, it, it was a slow burn, and it was some definite drama uh, before all this was able to come about. Now, uh, like I said, he was hired in 1977, and uh, things were so bad for the school financially, at least the football team financially, uh, to the point where they couldn't pay him more than $35,000 a year. But for some reason, some way, they were able to, you know, form the second highest uh, budget in the conference in terms of recruiting, and that was able to sweeten the deal. Now, mind you, here's a, here's a story here. Jim Mora and also the legendary Bill Walsh was actually pitched the job, and they were just like, nah, you're definitely, we're definitely not doing that. You're not paying us enough. So, you know, there you go. But, um, you know, for Brooks... He, you know, he started, and like I said, it was rocky. In his first four seasons, I believe he was just winning more. He couldn't win more than two games, um, you know, in four of those seasons. And it was just really bad. And off the field, of course, like I said, there was there was drama, too, uh, with a pay-for-credit scheme. Uh, you had multiple players being uh, accused of assault on women. Um, these are talk we were talking about past and present players, uh, at least, at, you know, present meaning at that time. And, uh, you know, it was really bad. You also had uh, an illegal travel fund. I'm, you know, assuming that was referring to, you know, um, recruiting as well as, you know, misuse of phone cards. You know that, you know, because, of course, there's no cell phones back then. So it was just a lot of drama. And on the field, of course, it wasn't that much better. Uh, in 1983, they had, you know, a pretty bad season as well that would end in a 0-0 tie versus the Beavers. Do we call that the toilet bowl? Terrible game. Um but, you know, at the bottom, 
it can only go, you know, it can only go up from there. And by 1989, the team had gotten their stuff together, and they would end up winning their first ball game in a long time. They would end up beating uh, Tulsa in the Independence Bowl, 21, uh, sorry, it was 24 to 21. And you know, again, I'm not alive at this time, so it's like, you know, I'm just kind of observing it and you know, looking at the highlights uh, and reading whatever articles I can find, and you know, getting perspective from that. And you know, it was a, it was a rocky time, and I mean. Um, I can imagine, I mean, it was actually so bad for Rich Brooks that he actually tried to resign. Um, but I'm, you know, and I'm thinking in my head, you know, um, you know, because the president at the time, uh, William Boyd, he, was, he just wasn't having it. And I'm thinking in my head, that's probably because, I mean, he, he probably realizes that's all he can get right now. And, you know, he just has to be realistic, maybe. And, you know, but it's just crazy for a team to be like that, to be so far down, to kind of made it as far as they have and you know we haven't won a national championship yet but i definitely think uh, we've been making strides and you know you have to make those strides first before all that can happen you gotta walk before you can crawl i think we're at the, to the point now we have to crawl before you can walk and i think at the, we're at the point now where we're at least we're at least jogging or we're at least at full sprint and you know it eventually we can eventually reach our goal. I think it's definitely possible, but you know, coming from where we were, I, man, it's it's really crazy. Uh, but um, Brooks's best season will come in 1994. He will lead us to an outright Pac-10 title because that's what it is now. And uh, well, you know, in '94, and he would also lead us to a Rose Bowl. Now we would end up losing that Rose Bowl, but I think it was the journey that was the, the big significant thing because on the way there we had to face up against number nine Washington, of course, our biggest rival. And at this point, uh, we had only beaten this team, you know, three times in the past 20 years. And as far as I know, every everybody was telling me they just kick our ass. That's that's what they told me. That's what they were saying. And we happened to be up in this game, 24 to 20. And mind you, like I said, I was very, very young uh, when I first saw this. This was 94, right? But I remember the actual play, the moment in which, you know, Kenny made the pick. I can't remember all the play. I can't remember, you know, I couldn't tell you without having to look everything up who the, you know, the starting roster was, or none of that. But anyways, I, I remember the moment of the pick, like I said, because I remember people's reaction, people looking with so much joy and so much happiness. We were up 24 to 20 in that game, but Washington was driving. That game could have potentially won the game for them had they would have scored, uh, you know, and and uh, to see Penny Wheat, Kenny Wheaton at that last second, even when I look at it now, it's just like, wow, you know, just kind of just sealing it. You know, he takes the interception, 97 yards, and, you know, it seals the deal. And this play, like I said, you know, not only just saved that game because we could have lost it, uh, it saved the season because eventually we win. You know, we won the Pac-10. We went to the Rose Bowl. We, you can't go to the Rose Bowl if you don't win the Pac-10, win or lose. And, you know, it meant a lot. And um, and this is the reason why you won't hear me say a whole lot about Nike per se and Phil Knight. And that's not to you know uh, you know cast away that connection, but in reality, you know that connection or those 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 uniform options and all that and that you know that partnership did not begin until the '95 season. It's not like you know they cared about us. Nike cared about us this entire time. It wasn't like we had this you know, been if you know, this relationship like that from the get go. You know, that play opened all that up and opened up all those opportunities and made Oregon uh, the nationally known program it, it is today. That that play single handedly in that season single handedly because again it's weird because, you know, media has a has a way to play into things too. Of course you got, you know, the movies like the Mighty Ducks playing it too. You got people, you know, confusing those ducks for these ducks and it just all ducks this and ducks that. You know, and, and, and you know, I I still to this day I'm not necessarily a big time hockey fan, but I'm I'm a I'm a fan of the Anaheim Ducks though for that reason. So it's just you know, it was it was a it was a wild ass time and um you know, you gotta be there to kinda see it was like a, you kinda gotta be there to see it. Uh, and be there to understand it and be in the midst of it to understand it. And even, you know, me just being so young, I barely got it, you know, just because I'm so young. But, I mean, it just stuck with me, just seeing the happiness, seeing the actual play itself, know, learning it, um, and what, what all came from it, it meant a lot. Um, 
Now, this would be Rich Brooks' last season, and he would leave the team with 91 wins, which would, of course, surpass Casanova as the most. And his offensive coordinator, Mike Bellotti, would take over after that. And in his first season, uh, he would uh, lead them to a 93 record and a appearance in the Cotton Bowl. Now, in Bellotti's time, he would finish with 116 wins. This would be the most uh, of any coach uh, current or or uh you know, past now at this point, and he had the highest winning percentage too at 67%. Now, he would also, uh, in his second season, well, by I was actually not in the second season, but in 2000, uh, he had won the Pac 12, Pac 10 title, it's still the Pac 10. Um, he actually won a share of it with Washington and Oregon. This was a crazy year as well, and this is a story within itself because all three teams, like I said, they ended up having a share of the Pac 10 title and they ended up winning in convincing fashion in each of their, you know, ball games. Uh, Oregon would actually get their first 10 win season in program history. Um, they will get a win 35 to 30 over Texas in the uh, the Holiday Bowl. Now, 2001, this will be, oh man, this was an, another amazing year here. Um, you know, this um, this squad out of no, it came out of nowhere, in my opinion, because nobody was really talking about Oregon like that. And every time I brought Oregon up, everybody wanted to roast me. But uh, this team here finished uh, with just one loss, their first 11-win season. Uh, they finished the year ranked number two with only uh, one loss to Stanford. So you finished number two in the AP polls and the coaches' polls. Uh, but the, you know, the BCS, which I'm just going to say this right now. Um Determining a college football champion, whatever method that they use, because I know back in the day before, you know, uh, before the BCS, you had a situation where you would just have the media and, you know, different, you know, writing groups determine a national champion. That was convoluted. The BCS is convoluted, was convoluted. Even the college football playoff right now is kind of convoluted because they're basically, you know, going with... Well, basically, I feel that way because they're inflating whatever team has already been in the top 25, the preseason top 25. They're pretty much, they're going to ride with them. And who's been in the top 25 and all that. Anyways, determining a football, a champion in college football, in my opinion, has always been convoluted. I do feel like it was more wide open back in the day, like 1930s and stuff like that, but still. Yeah, it's really weird. But this was a year that Oregon was left out because of those BCS rankings. And again, this is a what if, um, I guess a missed opportunity. It was it was outside of our control. But at the same time, uh, I do feel, you know, we, they kind of did us dirty. But again, we were able to get our consolation in the Fiesta Bowl. We had to blow out Colorado 38-16. to I remember this game vividly. I was on vacation with my family. Uh, I was pro, and we were watching the game. We had the game on because my family is, is football fans. It doesn't really matter if it's college or the NFL. They're looking for a decent game. They like to watch a decent game. But nobody was a fan, really, of either team except me being a fan of the Ducks. Now, I'm rooting for them. Some people are just, like, not even into it necessarily. Other people, they start to roast me, uh, particularly, you know, when I'm, they figure out, oh, I'm really into it. Uh, but eventually, we end up blowing that team out. And uh, I liked it because, you know, my family was like, oh, okay, so you know a little bit about football. You know a little bit about something. Okay, we didn't know that about you. But I was like, I was really adamant about that team winning, other than for the fact that I, I used to live there. Honestly, I don't even know that much about football just yet. But, you know, um, just being there again, just vibing and, and talking football and learning about it and being having it talk to you, you know, while it's, while it's on and, you know, it's it, it that those those things meant mean a lot to me. You know, um, and that's why I liked it. I mean, I feel like I always had a, a situation where I could bond. Um, a lot of my best friends were college football fans, so we were always able to come to school and talk about it, even if it meant, even if it resulted in us arguing about which team is better. We still would have a great conversation leading into that, and even after that, you know, just saying yeah, da 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 this, and just sharing facts and everything. So, you know. It was a it man. I, I I have a lot of fun watching. I had a lot of fun watching uh, Oregon play. I mean, every every year, uh, good or bad. But uh, Mike Bellotti, uh pretty much, you know, he would have a solid tenure there. Like I said, he only had one losing season that would come in two thousand four, where he would finish five and six. Uh, he would uh, have a pretty significant year in two thousand eight. Uh, we would start off pretty hot. Actually, I think it was two thousand seven. Uh, we had Dennis Dixon at quarterback. Uh, Dennis Nixon would go down with an injury, unfortunately. So, you know, that got stymied. 
Uh, but he would end his tenure in 2008 with another ball win. Uh, he actually will win back-to-back -back ball games. Uh, he would end up beating uh, Oklahoma State in his final ball game. Uh, 30, I don't know the final score. score score excuse me Ooh, don't know the final score uh for that one but he ended up being meeting them in that final in his final ball game he went on to become an athletic director too so again great season that 2001 season will probably be the highlight of course we had joey harrington he was a Heisman finalist uh he you know threw for over 300 yards in that ball game against colorado again we had um you know just a really deep team that season and of course Moving on, we have another offensive coordinator taking over. We had the Chip Kelly era. Chip Kelly, that was that was a fun era too. Now, uh, it started off kind of rocky that first season. Uh, he ended up, uh, well, we ended up losing to Boise State. Everybody hit me up on Facebook and even MySpace back then talking about we lost. It was an ugly game. I wanted to knock people out like Legarrette Blunt did, but we moved on. We ended up winning the Pac-10 Pac title again. Uh, we went to the Rose Bowl. We ended up losing. So Ohio State again. Hey, that's the story of it. Yeah, whatever. Um, but 2010, 2010-2011 uh, was a great year as well, though. Uh, we would go undefeated again. Now, mind you, before the season, we had so much drama. Jeremiah Masoli got kicked off the team. We had LaMichael James miss a couple games because he got into some drama. Nine total players uh, would either get suspended or cut from the team due to some type of illegal activity. So for us to even do what we did with a backup quarterback, Darren Thomas, uh, really got me into recruiting because – I didn't even know who the hell he was. I He was an unknown to me. I knew his name, but I hadn't seen nothing from him. I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't thinking highly of the team. I was probably taking taking it all too far in, in hindsight and retrospect because look at what happened. We finished undefeated. We won another Pac-10 title. You know, of course, we blew out USC uh, that, uh, that season, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, blowouts against USC, oh, I'll always love those because everybody likes to say USC is all that. But actually, relatively speaking, you know, in terms of winning conference championships, uh, you know, Oregon is on par with USC and that stat. Nobody talks about that. You know, people say a lot about Oregon negativity, negative, negative wise, uh, you know, but there's a lot of good stuff that's come from come from this uh, program. We have a ton of Hall of Famers, six to be exact. Uh, we have Mel Winfro, Dave Wilcox. Also got Dan Fouts, one of the best quarterbacks of the 80s. Uh, we have, uh, you know, some great All-Americans that have come to this program. Michael James is actually second in the Pac-12 in career rushing yards. So we get a bad rap. You know, we've had some bad years. But again, you know, we've shown that we can we can win something and do things, you know. Um, we did come up short in the national championship game versus Auburn. We played the hell out of Auburn. Um, and, you know, it came down to one bad play, in my opinion. And, you know, had somebody follow through on a tackle, who knows what would have happened. The final score was 22 to 19. It wasn't like it was 45 to 19. And I can live with that, you know. Um, there's, cause there's a lot of teams that haven't even sniffed the national championship ever. So, I, you know, hey, you got you to gotta take it for what it's worth. You know, and that would be the highlight of Chip Kelly's, uh, you know, stint. He would actually win one more Pac-10 title after that, Pac-12 title at that moment. After that, he would beat UCLA in the first ever uh, Pac-12 title game. Of course, uh, between 2011 and 2012, we would add Colorado and Utah. So we were able to make divisions, of course, north and south. So that's what ended up happening there. Uh, his last season was in 2013. Uh, he would lead us to another Fiesta Bowl. And this was actually Marcus Mariota's uh, start the season he would have over 2,000 passing yards 32 touchdowns if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken was the MVP of the Fiesta Bowl we had Kenyon Bonner with over 1,700 yards as well 18 touchdowns maybe 17 touchdowns he's a consensus second team All-American so again you know a lot of great players have, have come through this program uh, we've done a lot of great things I know we haven't won it again I, I everybody named mama is going to emphasize you haven't won a national championship you haven't won a national championship okay well, I can live with that. I can. I'm fine. I'm fine because we've won a lot of games. I think we're to the point now. We've improved to the point where we can do it. Which just it's just at this point, it's a matter of time. And you know, as far as us not winning one, well, you know, there's a, there's a ton of teams that we can name that have it. Would you like to go through a list? Is is that does that is that necessary? You know, I mean, come on now, like. I mean, would you rather be Oregon or Duke? Uh, I'm, I'm just, I know, I know. 
Don't get me wrong. I'm going to talk my stuff every now and again. I don't want to bring teams down all the time just to elevate the, the Pac-12, but I'm going to talk my shit every now and again. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Would you want to be, would you want to be, you know, USC now or, you know, how they're building or would you want to be Vanderbilt? I'm just, I, I'm just saying. I, I don't, you know, you, you answer that question. Would you want to be Oregon or Wake Forest? Uh, you take your pick. Would you want to be Utah or, or um, I don't know, maybe Kansas, Kansas State? Okay. Anyway, Mark Helfrich would be the next coach to take over. Uh, his highlight would come in 2014. This was like a – you ever heard the saying by William Shakespeare, the best of times and the worst of times? This is exactly what this was about. Uh, Mark Helfrich would lead us to a national championship appearance in 2014. Uh, we ended up coming short. We ended up getting blown out <laughs> by Ohio State. Uh, we would end up blowing out, you know, Florida State too. So there you go. You know, we got a we got a playoff win. Uh, we got to beat on a nationally ranked team on national TV. Uh, we got you know Marcus Mariota had one of the best seasons of all time for a quarterback. Brought home the Davey O'Brien, the Maxwell, the Walter Camp. I mean, did he, he's an All American. I, I mean, come on now. I, I, I mean. We've had some great years. I think it's just, you know, about now, about time now to kind of culminate that with a championship. I'll say that even, you know, I'll say that too. But, I mean, come on, man. I mean, uh, I mean, would you rather have, you know, would you rather be Oregon in 2015 or like, or, you know, like Syracuse in 2015? Uh, you know, even Stanford, like Stanford, you know, they've gotten the best of us in many years, no matter how good we've been. Like, I mean, come on, Stan. I mean, would you want to be Stanford, you know, or Nebraska? Like, and I'm not saying, you know, I know Nebraska's done a lot of stuff in the past. We're talking about now Nebraska. Man. I know 1960 Nebraska. Yeah, 1994 Nebraska, of course. But would you want to be 20, 2012 to now Nebraska? 29 to 2009 to now Nebraska? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Y'all gonna have to think about those things. Well, you know, I mean, Ohio State, great program. I'll give Penn State some love. Michigan State, Michigan, yeah, okay, they're mid. But you're not gonna, you're not gonna convince me that Northwestern is a powerhouse too. Come on, guys, stop giving us so much of a hard time. Give the West Coast some love a little bit. Come on now, let's not make it like this. Now, like I said, the best of times and the worst of times for Mark Helfrich. Because in 2015, we saw us fall off a little bit. Uh, we started off 3-3. Three and three. We had a graduate transfer at quarterback, Vernon Adams. He would be hurt a lot. Our offensive line was hurt a lot. Was hurt a lot. Our running back, our starting running back was out. And just things weren't the way it should have been. The defense was giving up 37 points a game. It was ugly, of course. We all know what happened in the Alamo ball against TCU. Do I have to explain it? No, I don't. I know everybody, ha ha, y'all lost that game. Well, look, look, a bunch of you teams didn't even make a ball game any of them years or even get sniffed your conference. So again, I, whatever, y'all over here, you know, I'm just saying, <laughs> y'all hate on the wrong things. 2016 was a bad year, though. I ain't gonna say it was object. I'm, I'm gonna say it straight up. It was objectively bad. We finished four and eight. I was the, the worst record since the year I was born, 1991. Like I said, four and eight. We will lose to Washington, 70 to 21. Ugly Oregon State. Ugly. You don't want to lose to Oregon State. No matter how bad you are, you don't lose to Oregon State, or you get fired. Unless you're Rich Brooks. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> or Lynn Casanova. Anyway, they also lose to Washington State for the first time in 20, since 20, 20, 2004. It was a bad year. Mark Helfrich had to go. He got Willie Taggart. He was trash. He led us to a 76 record. He went to Florida State. He was still trash. And when we got to Mario Cristobal. And he actually wasn't that bad. He led us to a couple of ball games. I think... He did come up short in some important times, though. Um, I'm going to talk about the 2021 season. Uh, you know, we, we can go through the each and every season, but let's just talk about the 2021 season real quick just to kind of highlight it and what I feel about it, uh, my real true feelings about the crystal ball. That Stanford game was a poorly coached game by him, and I'm just going to leave it out there. The way he 
you know, his play calling, he could have killed the clock a lot better. He could have made some better play calling. Of course, Joe Moorhead wasn't there, but he should have had us at least score or kill the clock completely in some way. Way He should have been way better play calling was what I needed. And I'm going to be honest with you. You know, we relied too much on the graduate transfer. I think we should have went with a, with a freshman. Um, and we're doing it again. We bring in another transfer with Bo Nix. Again, I understand he has a you know experience with the offensive coordinator, Kenny Dillingham. I understand we want to take this to a tougher SEC offense, whatever. Fine. But, you know, I did not like what I saw from Anthony Brown last season. And I'm going to be honest with you, in that 2016 season, I did not like what I saw from Vernon Adams. And one thing I will say, particularly in the, in the this new you know, era of the Ducks, I don't, you know, I, I, I thought, I always thought the freshmen that we allowed or the young guys that we allowed to start and get reps were good. I mean, we, we let Darren Thomas play and look what happened. He led us to a goddamn national championship. So why worry about a graduate transfer? He's done what he's going to do. We know what he's, what he, what he's capable of. And, you know, he just fell flat in so many important games. Stanford, he fell apart against Utah twice. And as far as coaching, like I said, Mark Christabel, he left a lot to be desired. You know, last year, Utah ran the fuck over us. That's ugly, twice. And then we gave up 300 yards to Oklahoma. When I tell you the biggest loss was the strength and conditioning coach because I loved his energy. I loved his, you know, who he, you know, how he carries himself and who, you know, what he does with the team and how he inspired them. That ought to tell you something. And I love this team. So, you know, seeing Dan Lanning come in, you know, outside of, you know, bringing in Bo Nix and all that, I got to ride with it because I feel like I looked at what he did with with Georgia, and that's important, particularly with a team who, let's be real here, sucked on defense, and we need to improve, and that's been our Achilles heel, in our worst seasons, that's been our Achilles heel, 2016, we gave a whole bunch of points, a whole bunch of yards, 2015, we fell apart, we gave up 37 points a game, gave up 47 in the ball game, and three overtimes, that's, come on, that's indicative of that, look at last year, there was like two, there was both games versus Utah, we gave up over 200 yards rushing, and then over three, like I said, over 300 to Oklahoma, in the, in the Alamo ball, Kennedy Brooks for the Sooners goes off for 142 yards, has three scores, that's unacceptable, so I think Dan Dan Lanning does something to improve that. And I do like the balance of having uh, guys like Tosh Lupoy, who has some Pac-12 experience working at Cal in Washington. He also has some NFL experience as well, working as a defensive line coach, a defensive analyst. We also got Demetrius Martin coming in. He's going to be our passing game coordinator, also our DB's coach. He coached at 15 Pac-12, uh, all Pac-12. 12 defensive backs also was a part of bringing in six uh top 20 recruiting classes to ucla so this already affected the team in one way we've jumped up from 50 to 24 in the national rankings of recruiting we jumped up to number three within our conference so i think time will tell what happens with us in the future i think we have a good balance of the sec strength and the power that we've that you know i think the you know, the athletic heads and all that at the university have decided, you know, they become aware of it. So maybe we can be a little bit tougher. Maybe we can be a little bit stronger. Maybe we don't need to be so finesse. I do think it takes away some of the identity, though. I'm not going to lie to you, uh, because I think what made us unique and therefore a little bit, you know, different and good in a way, at least in Pac-12 football, was the speed, was the no huddle, was the RPO. But if it takes us to win the championship, I'm hoping I'm hoping to win. So, Welcome, Dan Lanning. I hope you guys do a great job. Kenny Dillon, you know what I'm saying? And it's just ironic that we're bringing in an Auburn Tiger to kind of see us hopefully to a championship. That would be ironic, to say the least. But I'm ready for it. And I will say this. I can't tell you when the championship is going to come. But in Eugene, there's always going to be an opportunity for one. All right, y'all. If you enjoyed what you saw and heard, let me know by taking a time, taking your time to like and subscribe. Uh, we, you can also follow me on social media as well. I'll be leaving that link available for you. If any, anybody hasn't told you yet, I love you. Peace out. One love. And I'll let you guys later.